<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Today, my guest is Maxim Tereshchenko, uh, who's, as always, a, a, a special guest. Uh, uh, Maxim is uh, a software developer, uh, a people's uh, manager, and first in this podcast, we have a rocket scientist, virtually a rocket scientist by by training uh so max if you could please maybe introduce you yourself a little bit further uh, and thank you very much for for having you here today okay uh, thank you much for inviting me and a uh, few words about myself yes yeah, sometimes uh, i feel myself uh, <laughs> kind of a swiss knife uh my career was quite uh, colorful and i tried different domains and different different uh, roles and positions starting from walks of life yes uh, <laughs> starting from rocket scientist uh, then going to a sport coach and uh, being, I didn't know about it. So which sport? What was it? Uh, so I am a master of sports in uh, kettlebells. It's okay. not very popular in Europe or elsewhere, except of uh, Ukraine and post-Soviet uh, Union countries. It's a kind of a lef- uh, weightlifting. Right. So, uh, yeah, and right now uh, I am... A, Managing delivery architect for one of companies, uh, Cap in IT, yes, in Capgemini. And uh, beside of that, uh, I am a people development leader. So it means that I, in my role, not only care care about the software, the applications, and uh, the architecture, but also uh, care for a people and. Uh, Based on my sport career, where I used to work a lot with people face to face, that is one of aspects which makes me a lot of pleasure during my work, working with people. Right. So you are my third guest on this podcast after Janek and Corey. By the way, you are all from Wrocław. And let's say... Uh, I wanted to continue the topic of, of, of managing people in an IT environment from, from the human perspective by people who are uh, IT trained, not, let's say, uh, humanity studies trained. There is an old joke that um, uh, I didn't go to uh, 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 a software developer says I, I didn't go to study at the tech university to talk to people uh, but i think that let's say my motto is also that most it problems are solved outside of it and they are rather uh, people's problems uh, than technology problems what's your take on that definitely absolutely agree a lot of things can be solved and uh, carried managed on a level of a communication, uh, not on a level of a technology. So um, our basic topic today that I wanted to discuss with Max is uh, the role of office in the post-pandemic world. What is, what, what, what is the office, let's say, office's role in your opinion today? Is it a place of work or a, or a place to meet? It's a place to meet. It's a place for social networking. Right. And do do you believe in fully remote work? Uh, I'm quite uh, old to answer to the most of on the most of questions that it depends. I can easily imagine a role, a position were full remote possible. And at the same time, I seen many times that the leak of uh, integration, the leak of a place to meet your team can cause problems in your uh, business success story. Right, so 
on one hand, um, I think uh, a job like software programming requires concentration because it's it's a creative job. Uh, sorry if you, if you, if we hear some meowing in the background, but I'm here today, not in my office, but with my two cats at home, uh, and they meow sometimes. Uh, but coming back, it's. Uh, it's, let's say on one hand, it's that we need to provide people uh, an environment which busts uh, their creativity and, and helps them concentrate. On the other hand, we have this new methodology of programming like pair programming, mob programming, and in creative environment, people need to learn from, from, from one another, uh, in my very opinion. What's, what's your take on that? Again, uh, it all depends on uh, maturity of a project. It depends on a maturity of a team and the maturity of an individual person. If we talk about uh, some senior guys who take uh, solid ownership on some delivery, <clears throat> sorry, in very, you know, <clears throat> very often, then they can work solely with no communication and uh, integration with the team needed. But when we focus on new joiners, when we focus on interns who only start their career, it's crucial for them to be a part of, the, of a society, to be a part of a group or vice versa. It is crucial for them to not to be a part of a group to distinguish themselves from someone else. Right. Um, uh, I fully agree. Actually, if you also hire people for, for crucial or strategic roles, at least at the beginning, they are to be somehow in the office hybrid, hybrid way or, or otherwise. Or maybe. I can add even uh, from the perspective of architecture, uh, application architecture. Uh, in one of standards, uh, TOGAF, yes. we have uh, such a notation that uh, success of architecture can rely on um, social networking because of stakeholders who are a part of social communities. And your strategy can rely on their <coughs> vision of architecture you will try to build with them. So social networking is also considered as a part of a success story in application architecture. It's extremely interesting what you're saying. Uh... We, we spoke, let's say, some, some, some other day that um, until the 19th century, let's say end of the 19th century, uh, the, the, the industrial era, industrialization era, uh, people didn't have offices really. So it was mostly um, a kind of, of, of marketing, right, of your profession, like a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, yes, yes, I also... Mm -hmm. think that that time there were no need in offices uh, in an essence right now we have uh, such uh, buildings which we go to to meet other people uh, 200 years ago people go to office to work to the office to separate them from others to uh, advertise themselves to put on their card uh, uh, a line that you can find us at the Market Street 42. It was a part of uh, marketing. Yes, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I work in a very small team myself, just a couple of people. And we have hired an, an office for ourselves, even though it doesn't seem to be very uh, economically justified decision because um, in fact, we could work from, from our home offices, but 
we absolutely need from time to time this this exchange of ideas and this exchange of thoughts, uh, which is totally different if we meet physically than we meet online. Actually, both of us talked for for for, for quite a long time over phone, over LinkedIn, and um, I think this is the first very first time that we that we saw each other, even on video. And this makes uh, this makes it, uh, an absolutely different encounter with another person. Absolutely, and uh, it's uh, a matter of uh, uh, say psychologist research that uh, video doesn't uh, cover all our needs in visual uh, connection. We are humans who three dimensional. When we see each other, we see uh, we observe the world in three dimensions. And that uh, characteristic makes unique communication one to one communication with other people. There were a series of researches done by psychologists that shows that children who observe their mothers on video do not catch all the emotions from mother. They simply can't absorb all the communications our bodies do through two-dimensional screen. Yeah, that, that, that's very deep what you're saying. Uh, I, I, I haven't heard about it, to be honest, before. Um, but let's say, how do you convince your team or the people that, that, that are reporting to you to come to the office? What you know, are your tips? That's very interesting because uh, the most difficult part of a team whom I need to convince somehow is meet to senior people. Right. I have no problems with juniors. That's interesting because I thought that this, this would be the biggest problem. <laughs> In my team, uh, we mm, install uh, Right now it's about uh, 20 people. All right. Uh, we installed everything in a way that uh, new joiners are glad to come to the office to see each other and to meet someone from senior guys who can share the knowledge with them. The problem is to convince the senior guys to come because seniors already have families, have uh, kids, have uh, uh, things to do at home, and uh, extra two hours daily for them uh, can be very valuable. So to spend two hours in a traffic or to spend two hours with a kids. Yeah, and how do you solve it technically, let's say to secure, um, to secure, uh, you know, all the data and, and, and to secure the code? Fortunately, uh, I do not need to care of, about that myself. Uh, and that's good. I believe that from one side, we have right now a lot of treats from uh, cyber world and cyber attacks and uh, scams and all other not very good things happen, happening around us. But, and companies trying to protect their data start uh, coming, coming with some solutions, how to protect uh, accesses to the system, how to protect uh, the data. And if before pandemic, it was very common for some companies to have restricted areas in offices, so you can come and you can work only from the restricted area, high secured one, right now, the same challenges are coped differently. Companies start to categorize the data more precise. They, right now, we have a tools to give access to a people only where that access needed. It's and all the providers, for example, from the cloud world, yes, AWS or 
uh, Google Cloud, all of them have built-in functions how to have a good granularity on access level. Yeah. Uh, so let's come to the question of pathologies connected with remote work because uh, I know, I personally know people uh, uh, that work on, uh, on into jobs at once. Uh, I've had a uh, with one of my candidates, I have a very interesting conversation that he, he knows a guy uh, who participated in the recruitment process and <clears throat> realized, um, and he, he, he's done a task uh, uh, required for the process. Um, he took himself way more time than than he could have to, taken and the future the future employer was just you know absolutely excited how fast the guy did the job so he realized uh, that he can you know uh, can, can can do all his tasks in in much longer time that uh, it is possible for him uh, and yes, he enrolled for two jobs, uh, even though the guy has some non-competition clauses, he, he doesn't care because, you know, he earns a ton of money working on two jobs uh, as, as, as a uh, high level uh, machine learning engineer. And yes, I, I know that this is practice that is not uncommon. I've had a so-called guarantee with one of my candidates placed because the guy didn't show up on meetings and, or, uh, uh, and you know, was not available on a call uh, in, in, in a given time. Uh, and yes, people work two, three jobs. And th this is the dark side of, of remote work after COVID. Uh, you know, it depends on how to observe such a situation. I also heard such stories. I even uh, know uh, one person before pandemic that uh, that the person was able to work to two or even three companies same time. But same time he was able to deliver. And it brings us a question. Is it a problem that person can work for two vendors? Or it's a problem, it is a problem in our expectations that when we have a contract contract signed, we obligated to work eight hours daily for a one employee. Maybe that is something wrong with our expectations about a job. Maybe it doesn't matter how much time you spend uh, on your with your I'm sorry how much time you spend at your desktop for a single vendor or uh, the deliveries counts if I can do the job in one hour uh, why I can't spend rest seven hours for another tasks there's an anecdote by Henry Ford I don't know if it's true or not uh, that someone was visiting uh, Ford factory uh, in Detroit in, in the early 20s or whatever, beginning of the century. And there was a guy um, uh, sleeping uh, in his armchair. Uh, and the, 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 the journalist or the visitor, whoever it was, asked Adam Henry Ford uh, why this person is just sleeping in, in, in his workplace. And Henry Ford answered, um, because this guy invented an invention that brought me, brought our company millions of dollars so he can sleep now. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, again, it uh, all demand, uh, I think that uh, it depends on what the output of your work. If it's a pure technical task, with no need for the communication, with no need for the investigation. You simply do uh, the repetitive job. 
it's up to you how uh, how you will apply that uh, knowledge yes but if you need to know uh, to gain the knowledge if you need to a share a knowledge if you need to do the research if you need to talk to stakeholders definitely you won't be able to squeeze two such roles in one day yeah that's that's very true uh what do you think about because you you you're an expert yourself right and you you used to work with teams located in very different locations um uh, what do you think about so-called digital nomads? Is it, 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 is it an upcoming trend? For instance, Indonesia offered some terrific tax breaks, I don't know, for, for IT people. And personally, I've encountered recently two Polish people working out of Bali uh, with, you know, <laughs> eight hours time difference. Uh, what do you think about it? Hmm. Why not? Right now we are again uh, living in a social media bound environment. And if for someone is crucial to travel and to uh, populate his Instagram with uh, photos from different uh, islands countries and to share that uh, to share that part of his life with others i do not see barriers here and you you don't mind working with let's say such people in your team mm. depending on what what your company policy is because i know bigger the bigger companies do not uh, always have open policies for such arrangements but uh, i i i've for the current stage, I do not see a problem to work with such a person only if tasks which I will give to that person do not require a lot of communication. Does this time zone uh, uh, matter? In, if we if we work on task based, yes. If we work on task based uh, approach, yes. If we simply create task to be done time zone doesn't matter uh, i my domain in it is uh, financial services and i used to work for uh, fortune 500 uh, clients and i do not recall a single project when it was possible to collect all project related stakeholders and project developers in a single place we always were spread through all the globe, different locales, different countries, different different time zones. And that is a kind of uh, IT professional deformation. We used to work with remote teams. We used to, to switch hours when you work with uh, US or HK. It doesn't matter. We simply, that is how my domain operates and does culture cultural differences matter uh, in working with teams located in different locations you yourself are ukrainian living in poland uh, this is probably the closest or the littlest cult to say the littlest the littlest culture gap between two nations uh, I find it very little, actually. I always joke that the main difference is that you add guys uh, sour cream to everything, including pierogi, uh, uh, which is true. Uh, but yeah, but seriously, the, the difference, uh, the cultural difference is almost non-existent. But um, how it is with, for instance, Indians, uh, Indonesians, Filipinos, or, or Asians in general, uh, I believe that uh, culture, dif culture differences should be considered as an input to any project who want to adopt uh, dev teams from in other locations. 
even tiny differences between Ukrainian and Polish people, we have differences. Yeah, it's like Big Mac is Big if, Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's but true. But there are differences. And if very you tiny, but there are. If you won't count on these differences, and if you are on a managing people manager role, you can have some miss uh, expectations from what you expect from uh, a team. For you, some part of a job can be trivial and you know if you put a deadline, it means that it can be a fire in the building, but deadline should be met. But from some cultures, mm, it is not. And it, uh, if uh, it's Friday and it is uh, 4 p.m., uh, the laptop is turned off and working day is done. Right. So I I, I, I find I find the case that in po both in Poland and Ukraine it's not like that. That we both nations have tendency to overwork. Yes. In comparison, for instance, to Western Europe. Whereas, for instance, Americans might work even harder than us, but yeah, probably we are both on, on, on the American side. Like, As, as for uh, teams from Asia, there is a big difference in culture to provide a feedback. Yeah, that's an important one. I've heard uh, a lot about it, that people are brought up in, in quite hierarchical environment and they are used to strict hierarchy which blocks them to tell the manager what they really think and it's very important right yes um, there is a fantastic book i recommend um, on the culture of entrepreneurship and and productivity and creativity called Startup Nation, and it's about Israel, uh, because Israel has, has a tremendous mm, success with, with creating uh, probably the second Silicon Valley after, after, after the Bay Area. And uh, there is a chapter there about, um, about Israeli army. That is one of the most flat organizations between the armies of the world. That, uh, for instance, I guess that uh, um, in Poland, uh, in case of of war, uh, an ordinary GI, an ordinary soldier, would have to, you know, cross several steps to get to the high command. And in Israel. Um, the line is much uh, shorter, which in the war of 1973 between Israel and Egypt, uh, a student of engineering saw something on the front, uh, which was the, 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 the biggest, newest Soviet weapon at the time supporting the Egyptians. Uh, and it was like a, a mine on a, on a, uh, on a thread, uh, you know, thrown out. And he, because he was an engineering student, he knew how to, how to fight against it, how to defend uh, before this weapon. And within 24 hours, he, he, was, he stood before the, 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 the chief, uh, chief commandant of, of Israeli army, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm citing this, um, this anecdote because uh, in the context of, of, of Asian colleagues working with. So sometimes, you know, uh, somebody on, on a very low level of organization, a very low level of a project uh, can find out, you know, the very crucial bugs, the very crucial uh, add-ons to be implemented and so on. Yes, so definitely. Uh, right now, nowadays, uh, if you think globally, you should admit the difference. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 
do we have do we have a, a global IT marketplace uh, job marketplace maxim in your opinion I <laughs> looks like our governance in all the in all the countries is trying to not to allow that market to appear because I do not recall some European country with a good solution for IT professionals to work and to live globally. It means we still have questions and problems with taxation. We still have uh, questions and problems with um, residence permit. Uh, so from one side, uh, the IT community by itself is ready for such market. For me or from, for, for any developer, it doesn't matter uh, what country the headquarter is located for a company you want to work for. for but for governance, of a country in which you are located is very questionable where your taxes will go. Uh, I meant something else, I guess, uh, because, um, you know, I, I had offers this year in Poland at uh, London level rates maybe not San Francisco right and um, I was shocked and I have clients from Scandinavia for instance and where costs of living are way higher than in, in Poland um, I even guess that let's say life in Wrocław is 10 percent less than in Warsaw maybe maybe even 15 percent for instance uh, and at the level of the country, Poland, the, the wages are exactly the same. No difference between Warsaw and Wrocław, for instance. And, but let's say um, the differences between countries like Poland or Ukraine and, and the Nordics and, and, and Bay Area in the costs of living are, 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 are huge. Mm. And personally, my, my opinion is that um, the job market will differentiate a lot. So this will be like with footballers. So we have stars that earn a, a hell lot of money and we have stars of programming that do the job for two, three people. And we have average people who just, you know, play in lot, I don't know, national league, like, like, like Polish one, which, which, which sucks. Uh, and, you know, programmers who just you know uh, write the code repetitive tasks um, everyone can learn it in fact within a year or two right uh, so i see that let's say the creative people will there will be a, a global market for for talent at the same rate but um Ordinary talent will earn according to purchasing power of the country. Mm, okay, yes, fair. Uh, and uh, why not? If you have ambitions, if you have a good mind uh, and you like to solve puzzles and you simply an inventor, and you see yourself as a part of something bigger and you want to innovate the industry, you should have a chance to do that. And uh, if your input mm, results in billions of revenue, then definitely you need to be paid more and yeah. have a chance to work for uh, some bright projects. Uh, same time, mm, 
you all other people should have uh, the same possibilities uh, and same access to the market as you said one two years right now is not a big deal to learn basic of programming almost everyone can do that yeah like i don't know i i learned python to the extent i can put some simple e-commerce very simple and it took me i don't know eight months a year something like that yeah and we can expect that for such level of it guys we can expect rates to go down because more people will be available to do the job uh, the rates will go down uh, and um, i see some specialization between the countries so i will now tell you a, a, a true story which is absolutely unbelievable but it's absolutely true from my holiday this august so i was in with my family in the middle of nowhere by the lake nobody within a kilometer on a grass beach and suddenly uh, uh, a, 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 another family comes in which was quite shocking that somebody else was there and they speak ukrainian and uh, a little boy comes to my daughter and asks about uh, how to get you know to some some better beach around uh, and i see that the family is speaking uh, the family look like 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 a very educated upper middle class family and they send the boy because the, only the boy spoke polish uh, so i uh, spoke in english uh, and explained to the to the gentleman where to go and <laughs> He asked me, you, I didn't speak a, a good English speaker, let's say, in such a remote place. And I said, me, me, me neither, right? <laughs> so what do you do? And I said, I, I'm a, I, 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 so in the context of, of my English, I was like, I, I work very internationally. Uh, what do you do? I'm an IT headhunter. And I'm a general manager of a, of a Ukrainian software company, which is open branch in Poland. Uh, so this this meeting was like really in the middle of nowhere, and then we started to talk about um, about the market, right? Uh, I don't I didn't even want it. I didn't want to sell this guy anything. I, I I think that we will cooperate at some point, probably in a month or two. Now they are let's say they have a freeze, whatever. Uh, but the point was that. Um, the rates in Ukraine are maybe even slightly higher than here, uh, given that the costs are of living in Kyiv uh, are, are lower than in Warsaw. He said some 20% or so. And I can only confirm that. I come to Poland uh, seven years ago, and on that move, I lost in my salary. I changed uh, the company <coughs> to the same position, same level, same seniority. And my salary was a bit, a slight lower in Poland than compared to what I have in Ukraine. Ukraine has some, some fantastic tax scheme for IT people. Yes. 3% this, 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 Misha said. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost like 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 going to Indonesia, you know. So, and but for, for for Ukraine, it uh, has the only, not only, okay, that is one of ways how to keep their uh, IT guys in Ukraine. How, what do you give people to stay in a country? right and they will stay and they will pay taxes to your country and they will invest in your local market they will buy local goods they will 
visit local markets and uh, restaurants you know, and everything. restaurants etc et, and all other things yeah so it's a it's a it's a uh, i have mixed feelings about such policy to be very honest if i were a, a politician <laughs> i uh, uh, if i were a prime minister which i don't intend to be <laughs> is uh, i don't know if it's uh, if it's if it's balanced enough um so yeah it's creating internal internal demand on one hand but on the other hand uh you know less money on on social transfer less money on infrastructure but it's just uh, just my my view of that uh but yes, definitely um, tax schemes are, are a way of attracting people coming to your country, right? From, from abroad uh, in the IT business, which is, which is also very important. Um, I've talked uh, with a few Indian people and Polish taxes uh, are uh, perceived too high for them. For instance, Estonia has lower or... And to be honest, they are high. They are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's a different model of a, uh, of, of, of a country. But let's say let's let's not go into politics because we are close to that. Um, mm, mm, but what do you think? Let's say apart from taxes, can be done uh, for for a country or a city or a city or whatever a, a place to attract uh, IT talent. And the thing is, I don't think that it is possible to invent something top to down. I don't think that any minister, anyone in a governance will be able to brainstorm an idea which will work. We should stop trying to do the waterfall things in a social media time. And if you notice it, that in your city, there is a, a beach bar where some few developers tend to spend their time with the laptops, you should start thinking how to keep them in that place and how to uh, advertise that place and how how to make more developers know about that place and how they can come there and how they can collaborate and build a new social network in that place. And then that social move will attract another people. You can't simply say, okay, in Wroclaw, we will build, we will build some park dedicated for IT developers where you will have a free Wi-Fi. No, it won't work. To to totally agree. Uh, we're slightly running out of time, but I need to ask you probably the, 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 the very last question, but the ones which is really, uh, which is really nurturing me. Uh, how, how it was studying rocket science? It was fun. It was cool, it was fun, and it's something incredible when first time you see a spacecraft engine before yourself and you can touch it and you see all these tubes and pipes uh, and the different shapes and uh, you start studying how to build such a thing. So my specialization was I am a constructor. So I learned how to architect a, a spacecraft launcher. Wow. And uh, sometimes it was very hard. And uh, 
a lot of uh, physics and mathematics is inside. But when you go to a production line and you can touch these things and you can mm, simply admire that sometime at the future, you will make a draw for a drawing for some parts which will fly in a sky, which will uh, fly to the moon. It's very uh, inspire you as a uh, as a young engineer. So as a child, you were watching the the star sky. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe this was pre last question. I, I guess that these studies are, are are extremely difficult to get in. Uh, you know, it's uh, or not. I, I, I will uh, <clears throat> because there's this idiom rocket science, right? I will say one thing which you do not expect. No, it it was not. And it is not. <coughs> and there is two reasons. Uh, one reason is because of a country itself and the politic on uh, during that time, how come yeah, Ukraine has huge uh, aviation uh, industry? How country perceive the future for that industry? That is a f one side, and another side is how people perceive the career in that industry. And the truth was that we had few possibilities only for uh, talented people to grow inside that industry. And these opportunities all very almost always you're connected to some uh, foreign uh, investors. So for you as a new engineer to grow as a spacecraft engineer, the only chance was to find a working place outside of a country. Right. And uh, same time to start studying, it was average. So you need to pass exams on average level. But to finish the studies, uh, it was an absolutely different story. It 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 was something like uh, like to say that okay, we will take all who wants to come to us and we will start with all of you but there is no guarantee that you will finish these studies okay okay uh, so my, my my older daughter is now in a very competitive high school and it's it's similar policy which i'm quite scared of <laughs> you know there is a story about a place where i was studying that when uh, that uh, <clears throat> faculty only starts uh, many, many years ago, there were no such industry like mm, spacecraft uh, engineering. And uh, the decision was to, uh, to invite bright students from other uh, specializations. Mathematics, uh, physics, uh, mm -hmm. electronics, <clears throat> mechanics, and they initiated uh, the governance. They initiated uh, the program, and uh, the rector for that movement did interviews one to one with each student. And they, collect, and they collect only high score students from other uh, disciplines. And few first iterations, few first levels, uh, years in that uh, university, they were completed only and only by high score students. Right. So the kickstart for that industry was on highly educated people. 
Uh, and and it went rolling. Sorry? And it went rolling. Yes. Later, later with years rolling out, it become not as uh, <sighs> strict. And right now uh, you can pass as an average. That's very interesting. Uh, Maxim, I think that uh, we could talk and talk for for much longer, uh, but I I'm afraid we're running out of time a bit. Okay. Uh, so I would love to thank you so much for for this interview. Uh, this is you're the only rocket scientist that I know, by the way. Uh, uh, but it was, let's say, it, it's a joke, of course. It, it's true, but it's true. But uh, let's say I learned, so I learned uh, a lot about uh, about uh, approach to uh, the right approach to mixing remote work with with how to how to how to save creativity with, with mixing this with hybrid work and so on uh, from uh, true practitioner. Uh, and uh, I expect that uh, our audience will, will also find it very valuable. So um, thank you very much again. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, I hope it's not our last conversation on this podcast. Um, so thank you very much uh, and have a great day. Thank you. See you. See you.